Can you hear Christine? Can you hear us? You haven't got your audio on. She can't hear, but it's her fault this time, not mine. <laughs> right. Okay. Last week, I forgot to turn the microphone on. Right. <laughs> it doesn't work very well. <laughs> I've just turned mine on. <laughs> That's better. Can you hear us now? Yes, thank you. It Can came up with different messages from normal, so you. that <laughs> confused me. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, is that better? Yes, yes. Welcome. It's lovely to be here. Um, it looks like we're all far away. If you want to move a bit further forward, you're welcome to do so, but that may be too much to do later. But we're moving around a little bit anyway, so don't worry if you see that. Welcome. I wonder what your name is. My name is David. And depending on your name, you may think that David's a good name or a bad name. If you've met someone called David in the past and they were really lovely, then you might think that's a good name. If you met David in the past and he's really horrible, you may think, well, that's not such a nice name. But my name is David and I am, well, I've got lots of things I am. I am David and I am a husband. I'm David and I'm a son. I'm a David and I'm a father. And then I'm also, I'm Reverend David and therefore I'm a vicar. And I have lots of names and the names define something of who I am. And you can put with it, I am whatever. We're going to think about Jesus when he says to the disciples, who do you say I am this morning? And we're going to take a few minutes to think about that. If you'd like to turn to your, hopefully you've got a service sheet and a hymn book. You will need both. And just on the front of the service sheet is the, what's called the call to worship. Would you like to stand? Come to worship, to be comforted and disturbed. Challenged from our complacency, but also offered forgiveness and the hope of eternal life. Come to Jesus, prophet, priest, and king. And so we pray together. Creative God, you called us into your kingdom and adopted us as your children. Redeemed and saved, you showed us how to be servants, denying ourselves to serve others. To stay in spirit, you gave us strength to take up our cross in the service of the kingdom of God. Teach us to serve others, and in doing so, to serve you. Amen. So we're going to sing our first hymn, number 627. Number 627. You may want to keep your mask on for singing, um, because it just helps prevent the spread of the things in the air, but nevertheless, you don't have to, if you'd rather not, but probably nice to put on. 627, praise to the holiest in the height.
return to our services and the prayer of our faith. Lord, you walked with your disciples from village to village, and on the way you taught them about many things. Some things were not easy to hear or to understand. Say it again. We meet you here today, Lord, to hear these things too. You don't call us to sit doing nothing. You want us to be on the move, taking risks to change our world and save our lives. Help us then to draw close to you. Be ready to listen, then to act. Listen to two of those things, and we're going to have our first reading. The reading is taken from James, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that you who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a brand. We could put bits into the mouths of horses to make them available. We guide their whole bodies, or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them. Yet they are guided by the very small rudder wherever they, the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a word of iniquity. It stains the whole body, set on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and sea creatures, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same man came blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring fall forth from the same opening both fresh and blackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd of his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. 
For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father. Thank you, David. I wonder what your name is. Can you tell me? You can actually tell something about someone from their name. So you can tell someone where someone comes from by the name that they're called by, especially surnames. You may can sometimes tell what somebody's relationship to somebody else is really in Scandinavia. They often put son or doctor on the end of the name to say who they who they're in relationship with. Sometimes you can tell that my family of in my mum's side are McDonald's. You can tell immediately that they're part of a particular clan in Scotland. So what's your name? What does your name say about you? I want you to take two seconds to think about your name. And one thing which would describe you. So I am David. And I like this. So just for a few seconds, and then turn to the person sitting next to you and say, I am, and one thing about you. That may mean you need to be slightly louder, because there may not be someone sitting next to you. You may need to read the across the room here. So just for two seconds, I am, and then and I whatever it is, and then say the person sitting next to you. Can you do that? Or to cross the aisle from you in that case, from those two, in Alan and Hazel, and tell you you might need to sort of do a three, three people or something like that. So very quickly, do you want to just do that with the people sitting next to you? And if you go that way, and then Hazel goes, I'll go to you, can't you? <laughs> Right, now what I want you to do is to tell me the name of the person who you've just spoken to and what they said about themselves. So there's a nice loud voice in there to do that. So let's start here. Um, Gene said, I am Gene. I am your wife. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it, that's, that's good. That tells you something about Gene. What is what's that? What did I He said, he said, he was my husband. That's all right. I'm here as a rap treasure. That's all right. What did did Dan say? I am, and she is my friend. That's it. I spoke to Anne, said, Lord, Anne, and I'm Joel. And I spoke to Wendy, said, Lord, (laughs) Joel. What did Tony say? What did say? What did Tony say? What did Tony say? What did Tony say? I said, uh, Judith said this, I'm Judith, and uh, not sure if really wants to talk to her. <laughs> and I said, You know this, and you are my husband. What we say, what the names and the words we use have power, they can define us, so because we, we speak a fun. But how many of you have ever had somebody tell you something awful about you? You're daily and you are. Useless, you're not good at your stupid, you're foolish, or whatever. Did anybody say something like that to you? Obviously, not your daily, but, but, but the words that people speak over you sometimes have power, don't they? Remember that old wine that used to say it's called sticks and stones? Want to let that go? Say that again. Sticks and stones are great, I've gone, gone, and not hurt them. Yeah. 
sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will not hurt me, or words will not Load of rubbish. <laughs> words are very powerful. You know? And if you've had words spoken over you, they can become quite controlling. They can become quite defining. You will never be. If you watched the tennis last night, the, the Canadian girl was told that she would never be a tennis player. She ought to stop going to playing tennis and go back to school by her teachers. Now, if she had listened to that, that would have controlled her and defined her for the rest of her life. I was told at the age of 11 that I was tone deaf and I would never be able to play an instrument or sing. The teacher was right. I'm not tone deaf. I, and I've learned taught myself to play the guitar, but I could easily have never have missed out on all of that. I was told at the age of seven I could never paint because I was messy and what I painted was awful. And so I stopped painting. And until I got to my early, late 30s, early 40s, I didn't paint again. Since then, I started painting. But so for many years, I didn't have the fun of painting. And the, don't make a mess. And we just said that to their children. And so we don't explore, we don't experiment, we don't engage in the wider world. Because exploring and engaging is, is about making a mess sometimes, isn't it? Don't climb that tree, you'll fall and hurt yourself. There's all sorts of things we tell people not to do. But also, there's things we tell people to do. And that can sometimes be good or bad. You should, you ought to. Why don't you? Words have power. And so when Jesus asks the disciples who the people say are, he's looking at how they define them. What do people say? You're John the Baptist, you're Elijah. They're saying something about what they think Jesus is like. They're defining his character. They're putting him in a box. Then do they put him in a box? Sometimes we don't like being in boxes. Sometimes boxes are quite secure. And we have to work through sometimes where the boxes are. I wonder what words people have spoken over you. For good or for bad. I don't know about you, but I have a little inner voice, which has been my own madness. But I have a little dialogue with myself sometimes. It's hard to believe it. It's my life. You know, it's my life. <laughs> but, but there are little things, that, and without realising it, I have certain sort of attitudes and approaches because I've learned those things and I do it this way but they're, they're, and, and they, they constrain what I do and I don't need to tell, tell anybody else them, but they're there in the background do it this way do it that way it's those things which control us Jesus was saying I'm not going to be controlled by other people's expectations of me and when he says to people who do you say that he says I'm not the Messiah and that's a good answer that's a positive answer we're going to, just for a moment, hold that thought till we come to the next part. But before we do that, we're going to turn to our service sheets again. And we're going to say a song of praise. It tells us something about who Jesus is. And then we're going to sing a couple of songs. Lord God, we praise you that your ways are not our ways. We praise you for the gift of your wonderful son. We say it again. Praise him. Praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness, praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. He took risks for us, greater than we could ever comprehend. He took on the troubles and heartaches of the world and died on the cross. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness, praise him, Praise him, ever in joyful song. He rose again and gives us new life in him, life in all its fullness, life forever. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Amen. We're going to sing number 519. I don't know if anybody else knows this. So it might be me singing. Oh, Tony knows it. That's good. It might be me singing a solo, which means you'll realise I can't sing an anthem. Uh, and then we'll sing it a second time. So we'll sing it through twice. So if you're not familiar, you can get an idea of how it goes. <laughs>
Flat to be seated. And because you've been so good, Sarah, isn't it? Would you like to come and help me a second? What I'd like you to do is take these rounds and let everybody take two. And they don't have to be the same colour, but if you've got two of the same colour, that's fine. You don't need to take two. You, your natural inclination would be to say only take one, but there is a reason. Take two, please. Take them out and give them to everybody, and then after that, you can have some as well. <laughs> Just while she's doing that, I wonder in terms of some of your um, ideas about how the world is, whether you have certain ways of seeing things, and that's the way it always will be. I was reminded again last night when I was watching the tent that I have this little inner voice inside me which says she's an English girl, so therefore she's going to do really well and then lose. <laughs> because we have that inner little monologue, don't we, that worldview that says if you're English, you'll be a plucky loser. And it doesn't matter what, whatever happens, that's the, that's the monologue we have. It's called a worldview. It's, it's the assumptions we make about the way the world is. I don't know whether you realise, but in your glass, in your eyes, as you look around you now, you have a little black spot where there is no light getting into your brain. You actually have one in each eye. It's where the optic nerve comes. And that little black spot is there all the time. You can't hide from it. Okay. Do you want to take some? No. You've got some as well. Love it. Thank you. There's all these left for me, isn't that? <laughs> I have to tell people next time if they come, they might get some sweets. <laughs> but that little black spot is there all the time on each other. But you don't see it because your brain has learned to not see it. And it just fills in the blank space for you. So what I'd like to do now, because you've got your quality sweets, is take them out of their wrappers, please. Put the sweet down and just take the, silver, the plastic foil off the outside. So you have to be careful, you can't just rip into them. You need to take the foil off as well, otherwise you've got a big black spot in front of you, right? And then just for the next few minutes while I'm talking, what I'd like to just do, sort of like a big stained glass window, is hold your bits of foil as a film over your eyes. Okay? So you're seeing the world with that colour. It might feel a bit weird, but you'd be surprised at how quickly your brain will get used to it. And something like this was going on when Jesus asks Peter, who do you say? And he says, I'm the Messiah. And then Peter says, after Jesus says he's going to die, no Lord, it cannot be so. Because what Peter is doing is looking at Jesus through certain lenses or worldviews. This is how the world is. And he's seeing it, if you like, through pink quality street. But the trouble is that actually Jesus sees the Messiah in a different way. Words are very tricky. I think you need to put the foil rather than the, the, the not the foil, the um, film. Can't see anything you put the foil up. <laughs> but as you get used to your eye, get, your eye gets used to seeing the world as being pink or yellow or whatever it color it is in front of you. And you just get used to it and you can make all sorts of assumptions. I had for many years a pair of yellow sunglasses to use to drive with. You get to say, for you don't even notice you're wearing them because your eyes are just used to doing it and your brain compensates. Now, if you take down your film, the world immediately looks slightly different for a few moments because you've got used to seeing it through pink and your brain does all sorts of clever things to fill in the gaps. You might try it at home and you get home. Watch, try watching the television half an hour with the film on and you'll forget it's even there. Stick it on the glasses or something. You'll be surprised. I did try and buy some film, but I can't buy it anymore. I used to get it from florists. But because it's not green, they don't make it anymore, which is really good. You know what I'm Pardon? Not green colour. Not green colour. No. It's very green in the eco sense. You know. And there's another worldview in that, isn't there? That we're having to learn how to see the world in a different way because of what's happening with climate change. And assumptions about how we used to think the world was and things we could do 
We used to think having cars and travelling everywhere was a really good idea. I mean, going for two holidays abroad and things like that. But now we're realising there's a cost, a consequence of that. Thing. And we have to be slightly more aware of what the choices we make. There's a change in worldview. We're changing the lens that we look at the world. Peter had a worldview of what the Messiah was going to be like. And he had a picture of the Messiah who was going to come and be a great king and make the world just a lovely place to be. It would be nice when the Messiah was going to be. But Jesus said, I'm going to go and die. And Peter said, no, that can't be, because that's not what I think the Messiah ought to be like. And Jesus had to resist being put into Peter's box about what the Messiah was like. And he said, no, I'm going to be in God's box of what the Messiah was like, and I'm going to go and die. And then he said, get behind me, Satan. Not very nice, is it? But he wasn't talking about Peter, he was talking about the words that Peter was saying, because the temptation would be to say, well, I will conform what everybody else is saying. So if this is what they expect the Messiah to be like, Jesus would say, well, I'm going to be like that. It's called peer pressure. In fact, those points when someone's, when you're in a crowd and somebody says, let's go and do that. And you may not want to go and do that, but you go and do it because everybody else is doing it. It's an easy way to get into trouble. It's an easy way to get into doing good things as well sometimes. But that's the story that Peter and Jesus are going for. Peter's got a picture of what Messiah will be like. The word has a certain meaning for him. And Jesus says, no, it's not going to be like that. The Messiah is going to come and die and rise again so that you might have the gift of life. Which is much better than the picture of Messiah that Peter had. But no, this Peter had to learn a new way of seeing the world. He had to, in effect, take off the pink film from in front of his eyes and see something in a new way. I wonder what words you would use to describe Jesus to yourself. And I wonder how much of those words are words which um, are confined by what other people might say. Um, I don't know if you ever used to see, I'm going to show my age now, I used to see a piece of graffiti on a railway bridge in, in Liverpool, which somebody had written once, Jesus saves. And somebody had written underneath it, Kevin Keegan scores the rebound. Now, if you don't know who Kevin Keegan is, he'll show you how young he but there is that sense that what we mean by the word is changed by the culture and the context around it. And it's the same when we think about Jesus. So where do we get our words from? And how do we understand them? Well, we get the Bible. That helps us to understand Jesus. But even then, we have to do a bit more work. Because it's not enough just to say, well, the word's this. But what does the word mean? And that causes his disciples to go a bit deeper than just taking the word at face value. Nor just taking the word at face value because I've said it. Because I speak with the worldview as well. I have colours in front of my eyes all the time. And so I understand Jesus in one particular way. But it may not be all of the story. And there's always more to the story of Jesus than we've got so far. And that's the challenge to us to be those who say, Jesus, I want to see you the way you are. And I want to use the words that you've got rather than the words I understand as me. And then we can begin to let him give us a new world of seeing things his way. We're going to think about that again in a moment, but we're going to sing our next hymn now, and it's number 169. That's it. Which I think is fourth in our way of Lord and Joe. Yes. Oh, here's the same one. Sorry, yeah, that's last one, of course, in my name. Father, here's the fairy of that's right. Thank you.
So we're going to, in a moment, pray together. All of you that I'd like to invite you to come forward and take from within my lovely box a cup of fruit. A slightly long one, a slightly short one, or a slightly thick and a slightly thin one, if you like. Come and take one of each, and then I've got for you a bit of wine as well, which you will need. So that's how you get. There's all sorts of assumptions you make about these things, about people's mobility and all those sorts of things as well, which is not always helpful. It's the help. Just to be aware that the wire has got this bit of metal onto it, so you can take it in your eyes. Thank you. Got this at home, and that would be really helpful as well. So, what I'd like to do in a minute is to take your two bits of cornus. I pruned our cornus yesterday. Very helpful that it needed root pruning. And then just with your bits of wire, so just wrap it around it and make it into a cross. Nothing much different. But as you do that, just think about who are those around you who are carrying crosses? Maybe crosses of illness, or crosses of pain, or crosses of disappointment. It may be crosses of bereavement and sadness. It may be crosses because of what's going on in their life or the world around them. Many people in other parts of the world who are carrying crosses because of war and conflict. All sorts of reasons. And just as you make your, your cross, just simply pray for them. Asking God to help them as they carry their cross. Father, we bring before you those who we have thought of as we've been making our crosses. Help them with your strength, your love, your care. Help them to know that they are your children. For we listen to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll pick your crosses there just a moment, but we're going to come back to them in a second. But Jesus says to Peter, once he understands what it is to be a follower of his, once he's understood what this, the Messiah is like, he says, now you've got to take up your cross and follow me. And taking up our cross is sometimes about putting up with something which we just don't like. But sometimes taking up your cross is an active decision to say, I'm going to go in this path 
whatever the cost might be. And that means that I've got to put up with what everybody else thinks about land and art. I'm reminded of a, a young girl we met many years ago who was not going to about 12 or 13, something like that. And she was being teased because she wasn't going to go to the parties and things that all her friends were. Instead, she was going training at the athletics track with her coach. And instead of doing all the things, she was getting up early and going, and get, going out after school to go coach, get coach. And she was spending all her time doing athletics. And all her friends said she was wasting her time. She shouldn't do that. There was much better things to do. It's like the Canadian girl last night, wasn't it? Who was told to give up because you're, go, you're never going to be a good tennis player. But because she chose to do that, she concentrated being a tennis player, she had to take up a cross. There were things she couldn't do because she was doing that. The same with this young girl, that she had to stop doing sorts of things that other people thought were fun, so that she could do the thing that she thought was right. I wonder what are the things in your life that sometimes you think, oh, it would be much easier if I didn't have to do this because God called me that way. And I'd much rather do what everybody else is doing. Just think of the fun I could be having this morning. I could be doing the Great North Line. I think I'd rather be here, actually. <laughs> you know, there, there are choices we make and there are consequences of the choice we make. And sometimes that means we take up the cross, either because somebody doesn't understand us or because we struggle with it. It's difficult for us. What are the crosses that we all sometimes have to take up? By the way, that young girl, her name was Jessica or Jess, and she became eventually Jessica and still and won gold medals in the Olympics and things like that. So for, for the sake of what was set before her, she didn't do the stuff that everybody else thought was fun, and she did the things which the discipline did, and that put, enabled her to become the person that she became, and even now still is. So what are your crosses? And just for a moment, as you hold your cross in your hand, Perhaps you want to ask God to help you in the crosses you bear. Sometimes that cross that we bear is about the attitude we have to others. Because we're called to love our neighbours as we love ourselves, to love God as we love ourselves, to let love our neighbours as we love God, to love ourselves as we love God and our neighbours. And sometimes that's hard and it's difficult and it's, it's a cross we have to bear because I've never realised that people aren't always easy to love. I'm not special. Ask my wife. It's not fair. She loves me anyway. But loving people is not easy. And that sometimes means we have to take up a cross when we choose to love. So we're going to turn to the prayer of forgiveness on our sheets. If you just hold up your hand around that, this will help you think about it as we do. And there's, there's in fingers that you need to stick in the air as we go through the prayer as well, just to remind us. Loving God, you have made us to reach out to others and to care for the all. We are sorry when we do the wrong thing, appointing the blame at others. Sometimes it's hard to follow you when life gets busy. Help us to be brave and bold. Help us to love you and each other. Amen. You realize how difficult that is sometimes. Holding your thumb up there, please, isn't it? Holding your, your middle finger and your index finger up. But that fourth finger, it's really difficult to hold up, isn't it? It feels difficult. Sometimes it's hard to follow when life gets busy. And little fingers feel, you know, they, they're inadequate. There's not much of them. So you might want to take the sheet home with you and use it during the week just to remind you that we're taking up our crosses and following Jesus. And then as we go out into the world, how we relate to others, and so we come to the prayer. Are you any good at shouting? I know we're English, or mostly English, and we're in church. And those two, in the Old Testament, it says more times shout your praise to God than it does sing. 
It says shout your praise to God more times than it says any words that you should say. So shouting is quite normal in the times of Jesus. We're just not, we're just not used to it. So we'll try, at least with a loud voice, even if it's not a shout. God, help us to know when to speak. Yes, yes God. God. And when we need to be more gentle. Yes. yes. Help us remember that our words are very powerful things and that we need to use them carefully. Amen. Pick up your crosses. Lord, we'll help carry your cross when we come. We'll help carry your cross when we come. We'll help carry your cross when we speak. Remember that God's love for us is what enables us to both ask for forgiveness and be forgiven. God's love for us on the cross that means that we are able to come to God's presence and know his loving care. So we use the prayer of thanksgiving. Lord Jesus, you died on a cross to show you loved everyone. We thank you. Lord Jesus, for your stories, we thank you. Help us to follow your ways. We're going to sing our final hymn. Will you come and follow me if I have a call to a name? It is number 834, True Stand Sing. together. The notices for the week are on the sheet. If you'd like to know a bit more about anything, please chat to me after. Um, our hope is that this service and the similar services in other places, we're going to slowly create a small team of people who'd like to help you plan and do the services. So if you'd like to be involved in that, and it could be any age, you don't have to be the older, the youngsters are older as well, then please let me know. That would be really good. And also say that the East Carlton Youth Club is starting again this Friday. So if you want to know more about that, um, have a word with me and I'll tell you I don't know. No, I'll, I'll make sure you know about how to do that. That's next Friday evening and that's here. Um, but I'm new to the youth club as well, so I don't know how it's going to work.
turn to the prayer at the back of the ascending out there. Loving God, we commit to following you this week into the corners of the community we usually prefer to ignore. Help us to pray and speak and act for change. In all we do, Jesus, help us. In all we say, Jesus, help us. When it's difficult, Jesus, help us. Amen. Let's sit down just for a moment. And ask for God's blessing if you go to here. In the future, I'm going to teach you a song, but I thought I'd be kind to you today and not teach it to you this time, but next time we'll learn the song, which we'll sing to each other as a blessing. But just before we ask God to bless us, I want you just to close your eyes for a moment. And it may be that people have said hurtful things to you. And those hurtful things mean that you struggle to hear God saying, I love you. It may mean that you struggle to hear God speaking to you. And so what I'm going to do is ask God to help us to hear his voice more clearly and to heal us where we've heard words which have not been helpful. And it may be as I do that, there are particular words that you want to just offer to God in your hand and say, God, this is the word which I struggle with that I think is about me. Help me to hear your loving voice instead. Father, thank you that you only ever speak to us words which build us up words which encourage, words which challenge, but words which help us to go forward. We bring before you the hurtful words. We forgive those who said them to us and over us. We ask that you break their power and help us to hear instead your words, your blessings, your loving kindness. God should lead us this week with the blessing and to hear his voice. And so may the peace of God which passes all understanding fill your hearts and your minds with the knowledge and love of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Thank you, Tony, for playing. It's lovely to have live music. It's really good. Let me remind you that there are chocolates left. If you want to take another one home with you, that's fine. Or for some of you, and you can always get take it home and give it to somebody else and then put it over their eyes and see what they can see as well. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Goodbye to those of you who joined us online as well. Bye, Christine.